Welcome to Cooking with Paul. Today we're going to make olive pizza. Now, olive pizza can be green olive or black olive, either way. Today we're going to make green olive. It's something different, something you may never have had, because in the pizza restaurants they normally use black olive sliced. But it really is good with green olives, too, as you will see. And to start, of course, we have to make the dough. It's the first step of pizza. So I've got my old food processor. And in past episodes, I've mentioned that this food processor is the one I use for dough. And pastry dough, pizza dough, bread dough. So I keep all the harsh smells out of this one, garlic, onions, or anything like that, because I don't want the dough to get contaminated. So this is my dough food processor. And if you can do that, if you can afford to have two food processors, it's a good idea to keep them separate. If not, then you'd have to make sure you really clean it out and get all that smell out. Okay. Now the first thing we need to start with is water. Now for this recipe you do not want to use the distilled water. You want water that has some kind of minerals in it because we're going to be activating yeast which is a living organism and we want it to be in water that has some kind of nutrients and minerals inside. So we're going to use bottled water though, not the sink. And I'm going to measure one and a fourth cups of bottled water. And yeast likes the water to be warm, so we need to warm this up. So I'm going to go over to the microwave. And I'm going to set it for one minute, 30 seconds. let that go. Now I've got, I buy yeast in a great big package and I have it in here in a plastic bag. You have to keep it in the refrigerator, yeast will spoil. And the date is on the package. This is good until April 2010, so I have plenty of time. And we've got our yeast, we've got some olive oil. And right now we just have to wait for our water. Another thing we're going to use, I'll get some butter out. And just a regular stick of butter, I've got here. I'm going to cut one tablespoon of butter, which is one pack. If you look on the side of the butter here, there's the little measures. So one pat of butter. That's it. Not a lot of butter, just a little bit. Put this back in the refrigerator. Water. I've got my measuring devices here. I've got sugar. I'll open this up and get it ready. Organic sugar. It's the best. The smell of organic sugar is so much better than the regular sugar. It smells more like a caramel. It's really nice. And then there's our water. And while I'm going there, I'm going to take the butter with me. We don't want the water boiling hot because then we'll kill the yeast. We just want to warm it up. Now I'm going to put the butter because I need it to melt. And I'll do 22 seconds. That should get a good start on that melting. And feel the water outside. Make sure it's not boiling hot. You don't want it boiling hot. You don't want to boil the yeast to death. That would be terrible. A teaspoon of sugar. One and a half teaspoons of salt. And I'm just going to mix those in a little bit with pulse. To dissolve the sugar and the salt a little in the water. Okay. Now, if 
before we add the butter, we're going to add the yeast. Because if you add the butter first, you get that oil inside the water and the yeast won't mix properly. So the yeast gets, goes in there first. And we want two and a half teaspoons of yeast. I got one. Two. If you look on the pack, packets of yeast that you buy in the store, which I'll show you, not everybody buys these great big yeast containers because you don't use that much. You can also buy these little packets in the grocery store. And one of these is the equivalent of two and a half teaspoons. So if you just use one packet, it's the same thing as the measure that I just did. But these also have to be kept in the refrigerator. If you're not going to make a lot of breads and stuff, then it's silly to buy this great big one. I use it a lot, so for me, I like the big one. It smells really nice. It's a really nice yeast. This is Red Star Company. We're going to pulse again. Okay. So now our yeast is dissolved in there with the sugar and the salt. We'll go get the butter. You can see it's melted, all melted, and it's not boiling hot. Pour that in. Pulse. Now that the yeast is dissolved, it's okay to mix the butter in because it's already in there. And the last thing we have to put in there is some flour. So I'm going to go get my big container of flour. Now what we're doing right now is called proofing the yeast. What that means is we want to, in quotes, prove that this yeast is alive. Because if something happened to it, say it didn't last in the refrigerator, or for some reason it died, because yeast is a living organism, th this will not rise. So we don't want to put all our flour in there at once, make a nice dough, only to find that it's not going to rise, it's dead. So we're going to proof it. This is what that's called. We're going to put some flour in there with the water and the sugar and the salt and the butter. And in 15 minutes, this should rise part way up. It should bubble up. If it does, you know your yeast is alive, you're okay. If it does not, you have to throw it out and start over and get new yeast. Do not use it because it won't rise. You'll get a terrible dough. So this is what we're doing. We're proofing the yeast first. So. In this whole recipe, we want three and a half cups of flour, but to proof the yeast, we only want one of those three and a half, one cup. Get my little knife here. And this time we do want to level off. We want it to be exact. So I've got one cup of flour. I'm just mix it, dump it, I should say, into the food processor. Okay, I'll leave the cup in there for now. Leave the knife in there too. Close it up, pulse. Five pulses is enough. Now, yeast does not like light. Yeast does not like drafts. And I have this on the kitchen counter. The window is open. To keep it from getting light in there and a draft, I've got cotton cooking cloths, or like pastry cloths. Um, you can buy them in a cooking store. And these are specifically made for food. So I'm just going to drape it over the food processor so light can't get in and no drafts will get in there. And we're going to set our timer for 15 minutes. Okay. And we'll pause now, come back in 15 minutes, and then we'll continue. We'll make sure that our yeast is open. Okay, 15 minutes is up. I turned the timer off already. And here comes the unveiling of the food processor. We're going to take the cloth off. And if you'll notice the foaminess, the bubbles, if you can see. Let me forward in the light. There's kind of too much light here. Let me cover this. Because the sun usually will cause a problem in the camera. And if you look inside, you'll see how foamy and bubbly that is. And that shows that that yeast is alive and doing well. So now we have no problem. We can continue with 
the rest of our ingredients, which is the rest of the flour. So, take this off. This cloth back here for now. And remember, we already added one cup to proof the yeast. So we need the rest of our flour. The total is three and a half. So we have to add two and a half more because one is in there. So we got one, two, and a half. Now it may need a little more flour. We always start out with less because if you add too much and you try and add water to it later to make it soft again, it doesn't work. So it's better to have it soft to start with and then add more flour and make it a little stiffer. So we're going to start with this, and if it's too soft, which we'll tell by touching it, then we'll add some more flour. Okay, time to process. Now I'm using the pulse, but I'm going to hold it down. see the dough clumping like that, then it's time to check it out. The reason I use the pulse rather than turning it on, it's easier to release if the dough should get stuck or the blade should stop rotating for some reason or catch on something. If you can just release it, it'll stop instantly. So I prefer to use the pulse. Just get all that stuff off my hands, the flour. And okay, now I'm going to feel the dough and I still feel it's kind of a little bit sticky. So I'm going to add a little more flour. Fourth of a cup. I'm going to add another fourth of a cup of flour. I'm not going to level it off with a knife. I'm just going to add it. In. And th this depends on the weather conditions. Flour and dough always do. Today it's kind of damp out. It's been a cloudy morning. And sometimes the dough is more moist, sometimes it's drier. So by doing it this way, then you'll get it just right. So here we go in a mix again. Okay. And now it's okay. And what am I feeling? I'm feeling that when I touch the dough, and I release my hand, the dough doesn't stick to my hand. If it's still stuck to my hand, it's too sticky. Just get it out, get the blade out. Now you'll notice I'm using the metal blade, not the dough hook. There's a dough or dough blade. There's a plastic blade that comes with these food processors that they say is for dough, but I've had very bad luck with that. It doesn't mix properly. What will happen is it's very short and it's got these stubby plastic pieces. And when you use that, it doesn't mix all of the ingredients in. And when you go to take your dough out, there's stuff stuck on the bottom because the blade doesn't cut through it. Whereas by using the metal one, it cuts through and mixes everything very well. So I have better luck with the metal. I do not use the dough blade. You just get all your pieces out of there. You can see how there's just some flour around the middle of this. That's under where the bottom of the blade is. If that's okay, it won't hurt anything. And then you want to push this together in your hand. It's still a little bit sticky in spots, but that's going to work out as we, this is called kneading the dough. Work it between your hands. I'm just pressing it between my hands and rotating it at the same time. And in the old days, the women, well, because it was mostly women that cooked, used to knead the dough by hand from the beginning. They would mix in the, they actually make a big mound of flour and then mix in the yeast and the sugar and the salt and the water by hand, which was really difficult. Uh, it took a long time. Their hands were covered with sticky, gooey flour. They had to get it off. And they had to work that dough when the food processor here were doing it in less than a minute. They had to work it maybe 20 minutes to get it nice and smooth, which is what we're, we are looking for here. Notice now I'm squeezing it on the bottom and pushing around. 
I want to make one smooth top surface. The dough is nice and smooth and soft, not sticky at all anymore. It's just right. Okay. Now I've got over here a plastic bowl. I use this one because you'll notice that it's graded. It's narrow at the bottom and wider at the top. That helps the dough to climb up and spread out as it rises. And that's what we want. Let me grab another bowl here for a second to put the dough in. So drop it. And now I've got some olive oil. And I'm just going to put a tablespoon of olive oil in the bottom. I'm not measuring. You learn by eye. I'm going to grab a paper towel. And you can see the oil in there. I'm going to take the paper towel and rub the oil around the inside of the bowl. That's so the dough does not stick to the bowl. And the olive oil will also give it a nice flavor too. Save this. I'm going to put the dough in the bowl, just as it is, like that. The oil that's on the towel, we're going to dab on the top. And you see it get a nice coating of oil also so the dough does not get a crust on it as it's rising, because the air will do that, even though we're going to cover it. So now we got a nice shiny coating of oil on the top, and the bowl is coated. We want to cover this with our dough and pastry towel. And if it's a very dry day, if you were having winds, or it was just really hot outside and dry, you could wet, I'll actually do it this time just to show you, because it won't hurt. You can dampen this, turn on the hot water, and wet the towel, not soaking, soaking wet, bring it out, just dampening it. What that does is it provides moisture as it's, the dough is rising, so if it's a dry day, it doesn't get too dry, because it does need moisture to stay alive, the yeast and rise. We're going to take this cover and put it in the cold oven. The oven is not on because the oven has no drafts and it's dark. It's a very good place for the dough to rise. And in there, this has to stay for one hour. I'm going to use this other timer because that one takes too long to set. There we go. One hour, we're setting the timer. And one hour, that will be ready for us to use for our pizza. But in the meantime, we have other things to get ready. So I'm going to get the food processor out of the way because we don't need it anymore. Just move it aside. Go away. And we don't need the flour for quite a while. So I'm going to get that out of the way. The only thing we're actually going to use the flour for anymore is when we actually put the dough in the pan. If it should happen to get sticky again when it rises, which it should not, we might have to use some flour. Or if you were going to roll it out on a board. Uh, we don't have to do that really for pizza, but if you did want to, then you would have to use some flour on the board. And try buying organic sugar. It's really good. It's a lot better than regular sugar. You don't need that anymore. And our yeast, put the yeast back in the refrigerator. You don't want to keep it out too long because it will die. You don't want your yeast to die. Especially if you buy a great big bag. Okay, now we have other ingredients we have to prepare. So I'm going to bring my cheeses over here. I'll get some bowls to put them in. Bowls are down here. You don't want to use metal, You're getting plastic and glass, no metal, because metal imparts flavor to things. So we don't use metal. Wax paper, which makes this a lot easier. I need two pieces of wax paper. This is a cheese bottle to store your and serve your grated cheeses. So we're going to be grating Pecorino Romano today to put on the pizza. It's a nice piece of sheep's milk cheese. 
Pecorino Romano, which the Sicilian people love. They have another one that they use that has black pepper in it, too. It's really delicious. Okay, now I have to get the cheese grater. So I'm going to move the cameraman for a second. <laughs> and get out the cheese grater. There we are. Okay. All right. And we've used this in other recipes before. But I'll remind you that when you're grating cheese, there's a rind at the end of the Pecorino Romano we, with a wax coating. We don't want to grate that. We don't want to cut it off because then when we store it in the refrigerator, this end could get moldy. That's a protection. So it's mainly for when the cheese is in a wheel, but by leaving it on there, it helps keep it from getting moldy. So we're just going to grate up to maybe an eighth of an inch from that, and no further. When we get down far enough, we could start turning it and grating it this way. So we get as much cheese as we can up to that rind. But for now, we'll go on the side and grate slowly and watch all the time so your fingers don't slip or hit any of those sharp metal outcroppings because those are actually blades and boy do they cut. I know because I've gotten cut on them. And when they cut you, it takes a long time to heal. And you don't want blood in your cheese, you might as well throw it out. Just grate slowly. This, luckily, this is a softer type of cheese, so you don't have to press too hard. If you had the um, Parmesan cheese, it's a lot harder, and sometimes a piece is so hard that it's very difficult to grate, and then your hand can slip a lot easier. This cheese being softer, you don't have to worry about that too much. You can see I'm getting a nice little pile of cheese. You know? Tap the cheese on the grater, it releases the loose cheese on the inside, and then you get your little bottle here, take the spoon out. And by using the wax paper now, you're able to lift the wax paper, make a little cone, and dump the cheese in without spilling it. Shake the wax paper, and that's a little trick for getting it into the jar without making a mess. Do some more. Go a little faster. Take a gamble that I'm not going to cut myself. Now they have, there are food processors that grate cheese. They have uh, blades. Actually, mine has that in there. It's an attachment. But the blades, like this one, are not this fine. They're much thicker. Actually, this doesn't have those. And when you use that, you're not going to get this really fine cheese. You're going to get like shreds, fine shreds. And it's a little bit different. You don't get the same flavor as with this really finely grated cheese. When you sprinkle this on your pasta or use it in cooking, because it's so finely grated, it gives more flavor. It also dissolves better, blends into the food better. Of course, it smells really good as you're grating it. Okay, there's a piece that fell off. Get rid of that. Just hold your wax paper by both sides. Make a little funnel. Just shake it into the jar. Okay. Do a little bit more, and then that should be enough. And that jar, you just keep in the refrigerator. And that will last up to six weeks. It does not spoil them. How much does a little piece like that cost? This would be about five to six dollars. But you get quite a bit of it. Uh, Parmesan sometimes is more expensive. A skinnier piece would be about five to six dollars, not this big. Cheese is not inexpensive, and especially this is imported from Italy. It's not American. They do sell American versions of Pecorino Romano and of Parmesan, but they don't taste the same. They're, usually they're made from cow's milk, not the sheep's milk, the American one. This is really made from sheep's milk, and it is from Italy. Okay, that's more than enough cheese. I'm going to put, keep your cheese in a plastic bag in the drawer of the refrigerator. 
You don't have to use a twist tie, just twist the bag, fold it under, and then put it back. I'll put it back a little bit later. And then we have our Pecorino Romano cheese ready. I'll put it aside. Okay, now we have mozzarella. Now, there's been an argument among northern and southern Italians about how to say this. The Sicilians and the southern Italians say mozzarella. The northern Italians say mozzarella. And a lot of the American people say mozzarella. But we say mozzarella. And if you ever want to find out how really it should be pronounced, just play uh, Rosemary Clooney, who actually was Italian, part Italian, I think, and sa uh, sang a lot of Italian songs. Um, there's a song she sings called Mambo Italiano. And if you listen to that song, she will say uh, in part of the song, mozzarella, and you'll know that that's how you're supposed to pronounce it. But of course, the Northern Italians would argue with me and say, no. I had uh, an Italian man that I worked with years ago who was northern and he used to tease me and I would tease him about that. Say, you crazy Sicilians with your mozzarella, it's mozzarella. Okay, now I've got this nice big piece of mozzarella. This is the whole milk mozzarella. You can buy skim if you want, if you're trying to lose weight or you're worried about fat, they have skim, but this is the whole milk. I like it better, it has a better taste. This is also the firmer type of mozzarella. They have a Trader Joe, they also sell a softer one, which is good to eat if you want it in a sandwich or something. But for pizza, it's very hard to grate. It's so soft that it actually would fall apart on the grater and make a mess. Okay, so before we grate this, we will take a pause and I'll move some stuff around and then we'll come back and we'll do the mozzarella and the olives and prepare some more things. Okay, we're back with our mozzarella, and we're going to grate that not on the fine side where we grated the Pecorino Romano, but on the sh what we call the shredder side. Notice how big these holes are, and you'll see as I grate this what it's going to do, because we don't want the mozzarella to be these little fine pieces. We want it to melt into a nice, smooth covering over our tomato sauce on the pizza. So we want the mozzarella shredded. Again, some food processors have a disc that will do this, but at the high speed of the food processor, sometimes it really makes a mess out of it. So I don't like to use it. I'd rather do it by hand. It comes a lot better. It doesn't take that long. Just go straight down, not up and down, just down over the shredding blades. And as one end goes down, we have less cheese, just turn it around. Keep grating and grating. And I can see it building up inside of the grater, so I'm going to release and see how nice that is. Nice strands of mozzarella. Okay, and I'm going to get a bowl, which I have right here. Dump that in there. And keep grating. It smells really good. The Trader Joe has this mozzarella that's made very, very good. It's a wonderful taste. Even if you eat it like this or put it in a sandwich, uh, a lot of Italian people like to have sliced mozzarella with a piece of fresh basil and a slice of tomato, some salt and pepper. And you can either put that on a piece of bread, Italian bread, of course or crackers, or just eat it like that. And it really tastes good, you'd be surprised. And you don't have to put any salt on the tomato because the mozzarella is already salted. They do sell mozzarella without the salt. Um, they also sell small balls of mozzarella in water. Those are not for this kind of recipe for cooking because they're very soft. If you were to try to grate one of those on this, or shred it, I should say, it would just fall apart in your hand. It will not shred. They're too soft. This is a much firmer mozzarella, so it's very easy to do this. Again, I'm watching the grater. I'm not looking at the camera because I don't want to slice my hands open. And I'm only going to go so far, and then I'm going to stop because there's no way to get all the way down to those blades with the cheese without cutting yourself. 
So you can only go so much, and then you have to stop. There's no skin on mozzarella, so you can braid it all around. There's no covering, no wax, nothing. I'm just balling it together here, making a wad to try and grate as much as possible. The rest of it you could just eat. Okay, that's enough. Set that aside. And there we are. And I shredded. Oops, I didn't have Got that in the bowl. And to keep this from drying up while we're waiting to do our pizza, I'm going to use the same wax paper. A little bit there. And just press it down over the cheese so air doesn't get in there. So it doesn't dry out. Because it will dry up. It'll get hard. You don't want that. I'll set that aside. So we're ready for that later. Now we're also going to need some parsley. And I need to better get my little cutting board out here. You should always use a cutting board. Don't cut on your countertops. First of all, a countertop is never completely sanitary unless you use special spray, which I have. Um, but the, you also you get it scratched when you cut on it, and you don't want to scratch your countertop. I'm going to use what would be a palm full, as you've seen in other recipes that I do. I don't measure it, I just take a handful or palm full of parsley, that's all. You don't have to measure it in a measuring cup. You're going to rinse it in the sink, and squeeze it out. That will get out any dust or dirt that's on it. Usually it's not dirty. You can, uh, I buy this at Whole Foods and they're very good with their fruits and vegetables. They're always very clean. But I still rinse it anyway. And this we're going to chop up with a knife, small pieces. See any big stems? Just take them. Italian parsley is very good for your breath. If you're eating something with a lot of garlic and onion. You can neutralize it to a great degree by eating parsley raw, and then by putting it in the cooking, it also helps to cut the bite of very powerful cheeses or vegetables like onion and garlic. We will be using garlic too. You can see just these, not too fine, just little pieces of leaf that we're going to sprinkle on there. Okay, and then we'll get a little bowl here and we'll throw that parsley in there. Remember to use the back of the knife, not the blade, to scrape your cutting board. You don't ever want to dull the blades of your knife, then you're going to have to sharpen them. So there's our parsley. We'll set that aside for later. And I've got a can, this is, remember, green olive pizza. Now, the olives in the jar, let me get a jar out so I can show you. If you buy olives in a jar like this one, and these have pimentos in them. If you like pimentos, that's great, then you could use these olives on there. Uh, on this particular pizza, I don't want the pimentos on there, it changes the taste. Also, these are in vinegar which gives them a very strong flavor. Uh, and we want the pizza to taste of olive, but not necessarily being marinated in vinegar with pimentos. So if you go to the store, in a can like this, they sell, these are green, medium pitted, ripe olives. And they're in water. All that's in here is water, salt, and the olives. There's no vinegar, no extra seasoning. So you're gonna get the full taste of the olive, and it will not affect anything else on the pizza where the vinegar might, the pimento might. So it's better to use these for the pizza rather than the kind in the jar. If you want to use the kind in the jar, there's nothing wrong with that. But remember, the taste is going to be really different. It's not the same. I'm just going to open this slightly so I can drain that water out. There's the water. And already they smell really good. And if you want to really taste green olives the way they were meant to taste naturally without 
vinegar and pimentos, try buying these. They're really good. Now, for you, this particular one is estate grown, no chemical preservatives, and uh, looks like a to, looks like a picture of the family on the back. Yes, that's the. Uh, I don't know if they have their name on here. It's the Santa Barbara Olive Company, but they didn't. They don't say their family name. Oh, here it is, the Makela family. So it's a family business, and these olives are really nice. Now, what we have to do with these olives, and this is, see, while the dough is rising, we get all this other stuff done. So we're not wasting time, just waiting. If anything falls on the counter, I don't use it, because I don't know if it's clean at that spot. You can see how nice these green olives are. They're pitted already, of course. You don't want to get olives with pits because you've got to stand there and take the pit out. What I'm going to do is slice these in thin slices. I would say 16 to an eighth of an inch. Because we want to make sure they're going to cook. Pizza is going to have a lot of different toppings on there that all have to cook together. Some cook faster than others. We're trying to equalize everything so they all cook at the same time. So when the cheese is melted and brown and the crust is brown, everything else is also cooked through. Not that it would be terrible to have olive that's raw because olive tastes good. But it would be better if it's all cooked since we're having it as a pizza. I'm just going to slice. If some of the pieces are a little bigger, it's okay, especially toward the tip. So I'm trying as much as possible to keep them the same size. And actually, I think slicing the olive is about the most time consuming of this part. Now, they sell, if you're going to use the black olives, they do sell the black olives already sliced. If you don't want to stand there and slice them like this, they are in a can and they pre slice them for you. So you could do that and then avoid this other step. But there is no, not that I've ever found anywhere, sliced green olives. I've only found these whole ones in the can. Um, Maybe the ones with the pimentos somewhere, but I've never seen those either. Black olives, though, yes, you can get plain sliced. But to me, slicing them, you could get different sizes, whereas the ones that are pre-sliced, I think they're all the medium size olives. But you could get jumbo olives and slice them up to the pizza, the black, if that's what you prefer. And the black ones. The green ones, you're always going to get this one size. Okay, let me dump these in the bowl. Back with a knife. Not too many more. That went on the wax paper, not the can. Anytime our dough is in there rising, getting ready. And having all the ingredients all prepared this way, it makes it a lot easier because once we put the dough in the pizza pan that we're going to use, it, we're using a deep dish pizza pan today, then everything will be ready and all we have to do is put the toppings on and throw it in the oven because we'll have done all this work already while the dough was rising. If you didn't do this now and the dough was risen, then what would you do? You'd have to leave the dough sitting there while you prepared all the stuff, and then it would rise a second time. Now, if you're making a loaf of bread, um, whether it's white sandwich bread or Italian bread, in that case, you do want the dough to rise a second time because you want the inside of that bread to be very light and airy and fluffy. And we're not looking for fluffy pizza. We want the pizza dough to support all these ingredients. So we're only going to let it rise once. And if you waited to do these ingredients till the dough had risen that first time, that hour, then by the time you did all this, as you can see, it's taking time, the dough would rise a second time. We don't want that. So you have to do this while the dough is in that first rising cycle of the hour. Or you could do it before you even make the dough if you wanted to. But I 
find it's more efficient to do it this way. Are you going to use all the olives in yes, the can? Yes, I'm going to use all the olives in the can. Because I like olives. You don't have to if you wanted less olives. You could, but when you see the size of the pizza and we sprinkle those on, you're going to see that actually that's just right. It looks like a lot now, but when you go to put it on the pizza, it's not that much. Okay, there's our olives, all sliced up, smell great, set them aside, so now we've got olives prepared. We're also going to get a nice tomato, let's see which one I prefer, I think this one. Okay, and for this, I need a dish, so I'm going to interrupt the poor cameraman again because the tomato will not sit well on paper. Okay. And we want to slice the tomato thinly. So first I'm going to get rid of the stem part. These are tomatoes from our garden, so they're a little firmer than the store tomatoes. They're easier to slice. There's still some stem there, so I'm going to cut a little further in. There. So notice no more stem. Here, there was still a piece of stem there. I don't want that. Now we're going to slice this as thin as you can without making it fall apart. Slice slowly. That's one of the tricks. If you go too fast, you rip the tomato apart. Just be very patient. Watch your fingers. Slice down slowly. And if you get just a piece, if it's too thin, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Because you got to cover the surface of the pizza anyway. And again, you're getting when you get close to the edge, watch your finger. Now rather than take a chance on this, I'll just save it for something else and use another tomato. You just want enough to cover part of the surface of the pizza. We're not covering every square inch, but I want to make sure I have enough. Better more than less. You can always eat it in a salad later. Notice how nice and red these garden tomatoes are. Or you could have it with mozzarella and basil. It's very good. Since it's already sliced. My father used to like to eat a slice of tomato like this with a big blob of mayonnaise. <laughs> Believe it or not, he thought that was delicious. Okay, and that should be more than enough tomato, so we'll get rid of the rest of this. Which I'll put in the olive can for now. Put it aside, and we'll set our tomatoes, nice red sliced tomatoes, aside. So we've got our parsley, our olives, mozzarella cheese, pecorino romano, the tomato sauce I've made on a previous day because I make a big pot of tomato sauce and you can use the same one. Uh, in the next time we make a pizza I will make sauce specifically for the pizza out of a small can of tomato sauce in case you don't have a lot of tomato sauce on hand and you have to make some. You can even make it with paste. If all you have is in the house is tomato paste, you can make a really delicious sauce for the pizza with paste. But I have this nice container of tomato sauce that was made, and that's what we'll use on our pizza for our sauce. This has all the seasonings in it already, and it's fresh. But if you don't have it, then there's a quick way of making sauce in the frying pan for your pizza. And we'll do that another time. Okay, so now what we have left on our timer, we have 32 minutes until the dough has risen. Let me show you the pans while we're waiting. Pan, I should say. I'll bring it in. This is the deep dish pizza pan. It's just the right size for pizza, and we'll just put the dough in here. And then later you'll see the pizza peel, which is when we take the pizza out to slice it, we'll be putting it on the pizza peel. If you happen to be in a house that has a really fancy oven, you have a pizza stone in the oven and you want to bake it on there, you would use the pizza peel to get the pizza onto the stone. But 
Uh, I had one once years ago, but it's really difficult because if you don't hit that stone right on, if you go over, the pizza will flop over, the toppings fall in the oven, big mess. You have to have a really big stone or the whole shelf of the oven has to be covered in ceramic clay tiles so that you have plenty of room for the pizza to sit without flopping over by accident. Because if it does, believe me, you have a mess in the oven and it ruins the pizza too because then it burns and it smells. You don't want that. So I'll set this pan aside too. And we will pause now and come back when the dough is risen and then we will form our pizza and bake it. Okay, the timer just went off and I just stopped it from buzzing. So our dough is ready. We're gonna come over and take it out and put it over here on the counter and right now right away we're going to set the oven to preheat to 400 degrees there we go and remember on this particular oven there's a little light that comes on when the oven is preheated and it will beep to let you know if you don't have that you should have a thermometer in the oven an oven thermometer to check the temperature so you know when it reaches the correct temperature. You want it to be at 400, so it'll be preheating while we construct our pizza. So now here's our bowl. Carefully remove the cloth, and look at that beautifully risen dough. See? It's nice and mounded, and it's risen up to the top of the bowl without flopping over. This bowl is just right for one dough. If it was a bigger dough, I'd have to use a bigger bowl. Okay, before we put it in the pan, we want our old friend canola oil spray, or pan, whichever one. And you want to spray around the pan, around the outside rim and the bottom. Just burst. You don't want to soak it. You just want to coat it lightly. Could you use olive oil? No, not for this particular one. If you're going to use olive oil in here, a lot of times what will happen is the olive oil will bubble up under the dough and it will fry it mm. a little bit. Sometimes it doesn't cook properly, it'll mm. be uneven, um, and it sticks a lot of times. Believe it or not, olive oil, because it moves around when it's boiling, parts of the dough will stick. I've had very bad, I've tried olive oil for the flavor, but it sticks. And this way it doesn't stick. You want this to come right out of the pan. You don't want to have to stand there and try and dig it out, because then you have a mess. So I've learned that the best way is the non-stick spray, rather than using olive oil. Okay, and what we want to do is plop the dough right into the pan, because we're not going to use the rolling pin method today. Put it in the middle, set this aside. We're just going to use our hand, so let me re-clean my hands one more time. Got my disinfectant there. And all I'm going to do is use my hands to spread the dough out into the pan and up the sides, of course. Just work it, and by dumping it in like that without collapsing it, you notice that I didn't punch it down. Like a lot of cooks will punch the dough down, new. No. Once you punch it down, it starts getting elastic again, and it won't spread. See how nice this is spreading out in the pan? Mm -hmm. Easily. I don't have to go like this, I don't have to push. It comes very, because I didn't punch it down, it's not elastic, it's, it gives very easily. Once you punch it down, then you're going to have to use the rolling pin. You're never going to get it like this. So I just dump the dough in and immediately spread it out with my hands. Very easy. You don't have to dirty the rolling wooden board and, or the rolling pin. It spreads way out. comes really nice and smells real good, too, by the way. We want to leave some kind of little rim around the outside. So you want to push it up enough to have that rim keep the sauce in, plus this is a deep dish pizza. If you like a really big crust, you could make a bigger dough and fold it around, but this actually will puff up, so. Okay, so you can see how nice that is, fitted in the pan. No holes, a little dent here, we'll patch that a little bit. You don't want any holes where the sauce goes down into the pan. Okay, next, we're going to sprinkle this with garlic salt with parsley. This is a natural one, there's no MSG or anything. Lightly, we don't want too much. It's 
just a little sprinkling on the dough. Give it a little bit of flavor. And then we're going to sprinkle a little bit, one of these spoons of the Pecorino Romano cheese. What's going to happen is the cheese will melt under the tomato sauce and help adhere it to the dough. A lot of times with pizza, the sauce starts to slide around when it's cooked. This helps to stick it, the garlic salt and this cheese on the bottom. Okay, I've got my tub of tomato sauce. I'm going to ladle up here. And I don't like too, too much sauce because then it makes the pizza soggy. So I'm going to just spread it out thinly over the dough. It's best if you use a ladle like this so you can spread it out pretty even out to the edges. This sauce is already seasoned, so I don't have to worry about putting a bunch of seasoning in there. Spread it out gently because you don't want to spread it so much that it goes up over that rim because then it goes back down underneath the dough into the pan and it will burn. So you have to be kind of careful. And for me, what you see here is enough sauce. I wouldn't put more than this. That looks about right. <laughs> Even my cameraman agrees. I'm glad. Okay, let's set the sauce out of the way. Now comes our chopped parsley. This goes into the sauce because this sauce, as it boils in the oven, I don't want it up on the dough there, will cook the parsley. If you put the parsley on top of the tomatoes or on top of the mozzarella, mozzarella, whichever either you're northern or southern, um, it wouldn't cook right. It would actually burn. This way it will boil in the sauce. And you don't have to use all the parsley, just judge by eye. We just want to spread some out. You don't want to coat the whole pizza with parsley. We just want some here and there. If you see any more big chunks, just throw them out. Just to give it some extra flavor, it also makes it look really nice. And it helps cut the bite of the cheese and a little bit of garlic that we put. If you had a garlic pizza and you were using fresh garlic, you definitely would want some parsley. Okay, I'm not using all of it. There's still some in there, but that's fine. Our next layer is going to be the sliced tomato. I'm going to lay that on there. And we're going to spread them out, kind of like so each slice of pizza, when we cut it later, we'll have a tomato. I don't want too many. This one's a little thick, so I'm going to leave that go. Try and use the thinner ones. Okay. And we'll just put this choppy one in the middle there. Put that in the bowl. Now on the tomatoes, these tomatoes have no salt, so I'm going to sprinkle a little bit of salt on each one. If you don't want salt, don't add it. A little bit of black pepper. Okay. Now comes our, which I have set over here, mozzarella cheese. Still all broken up. Just fluff it again with your hands so it separates in case it got a little stuck. But if you had it covered with the wax paper, it should be fine. And then we're going to spread this out as evenly as possible. Again, trying not to go over to the side of the pan and not get it on the edge of the crust. Some of it can go. I mean, you can't be perfect, but try as little as possible because then it melts on the crust and sometimes it can burn. Spread it as even as you can. And by grating the mozzarella this way, it's really easy to spread and get it even. It also melts better. 
faster. That's too close. Just, if it goes over to the pan, just pull it off. Almost there. Starting to look like a real pizza. And now we have our wonderful sliced green olives, which I am actually going to spread around. I want to try and evenly coat the top. And we have time because remember, we're waiting for the oven anyway, it has to preheat. Mm -hmm. So there's no rush things done. By doing it this way, having everything prepared and taking the dough out, then preheating the oven, everything seems to just fall into place with the time it works out. I love the smell of these green olives. They're really nice. You eat them plain, too. Now, originally, olives are poisonous. Yes. You cannot eat an olive off the tree because they are poison. They have to be soaked in brine many times, not just once, to get all that out of them, and then to, they are processed after that. Somebody probably came up with that since they're so plentiful. Yes. And most people really didn't have a lot of money. Yeah. Way back in maybe the a Greek, maybe an Italian, because they both really use a lot of olives. Yeah, there were so many trees in the Middle East, in Israel, there's olive trees everywhere. How they actually finally discovered how they could process them and eat them without getting sick or dying, I don't know who to figure out. There's our oven, so it's ready when we are. It works out just right. I'm just looking for space. It's kind of like decorating the Christmas tree. Where there's a space, so just put some olives. And if we don't use them all, that's okay. We could eat them later. Would you suggest green and black olive together? Myself, no, because the flavors don't complement each other. Okay. Uh, black olives have a completely different taste than green, and if you mix the two together, you're not going to get the taste of either one, actually. You're going to get some kind of mm. combo type of taste and I like the flavors to be individual when I want pizza with black olives I want to taste that black olive taste and the green olive one is a whole different taste well that's how Sicilian food is compared to the northern you taste it more for what it is yes northern is a lot of mixtures they like to put a lot of vet in their tomato sauce they have carrots and potatoes where the Sicilians would never put that in their sauce the way the northern Italians think the Sicilians are crazy for saying mozzarella, the, the Sicilians think the northerns are crazy for putting all that stuff in their tomato sauce. They want to taste the tomatoes in the sauce. Okay, I think that's about enough olives. I only have a few left, and they can be eaten later. Okay, now on top of this, one thing that Sicilians always use is oregano. And you don't want to do too much of this. You have to be careful because it's strong. So I'm just going to sprinkle a little bit here and there. And that's all. That's enough. And then one more time, here's our old Pecorino Romano. And that goes on the top, sprinkling. Two flat spoons. Not heaping. That's also going to give it nice flavor. It's also going to melt and brown on there. It'll look really nice. Okay. And then last, 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 we're going to drizzle a little bit of olive oil for flavor. Not to cook it, just for some flavor. I'm being careful with my hand. I don't want a lot to come out. That's it. There we are. There's our nice pizza. Looks good. Now it goes into the oven. And pizza changes depending on 
what topping you use and how much of it, the time will change. So today we're going to time it. It's right now 2.15 in the afternoon. So we'll see how long it takes till it's done and give you an idea of the time. But when I make pizza, when I start smelling it cooking, I begin to check. And I'll check every 10 minutes till the crust is golden brown and till the cheese on top has browned. That's how you know it's done. But today we'll give it a time so you have an idea. But it changes. Let's say you didn't put the layer of tomatoes. It would cook a little faster. If you didn't put olives, if you wanted just plain cheese, it would cook a little faster. If you put more sauce, it would cook a little slower because you got too much liquid. So everything you put on there, every time you make that, depending on what you put, the time changes. So you can't set a time and say, okay, I'm baking it for 20 minutes like a cake. 30 minutes and it's done, take it out. Never. It's always going to be different depending on what you put on there. Even the thickness of the dough. Say I wanted a really thick Sicilian. Sicilian's like a thick square type of dough that they make too. And that would take almost twice as long as this to bake. So we'll give it an idea. We'll give you an idea today how long, but you have to just check it. Just keep, once you smell it in the oven, keep checking it and you'll see what it looks like when it's done and you'll have an idea. So now we'll wait and We'll come back and check when there, I start smelling it, and then you'll see what it looks like at that point. So I'll see you in a little bit. Okay, it's been 35 minutes, and I smell pizza, and I'm just peeking in the oven. Turn the light on. If you look, you can see, I'll pull it out just a little bit. The cheese is browning. The crust is nice and brown, but I want the cheese to brown just a little bit more in the middle. So we're going to leave it in maybe 10 more minutes, and then we'll take it out. So I'm going to set the timer this time for 10 minutes. And then we'll be back, and we'll take out our pizza, and it should be done. So this will take 45 minutes total, because it's 35 right now, for this particular pizza with its ingredients that we put on there. Remember, if you put more or more sauce, it might take longer. If you put less, it might go faster. So we just have to adjust accordingly. But this particular one will end up being about 45 minutes. So I'll see you in 10 minutes and we'll pull out our pizza. Okay, I've just checked the pizza again. There's actually three minutes left, but in checking it, it's done. And you do need to keep checking it to make sure. And here it is. Doesn't that look nice? So pretty much the, the way to... I almost dropped it. Isn't that <laughs> What were you saying? Um, the, the way to see that it's done is to, by checking the, the cheese. The know. cheese and the crust. See how the golden crust. brown the crust yeah. is. Now this oven, I see I'm going to have to make a little bit of adjustment. Do you notice how the sauce moved this way? Mm -hmm. That's because the oven must be getting crooked on the bottom. The ha or the house is tilting because the, the stuff is moving toward the back. So I'm going to have to do, use a level and check my oven and get it balanced out. Sometimes that happens and you have to rebalance the oven. And there's adjustments underneath to do that. And that's why the, you'll see this cheese and the sauce kind of move toward the back. And you notice that I almost, you have to be really careful when you take this out so you don't drop it on the floor. That would have been terrible. There it is. Now we're going to leave that sit there for 10 minutes. We're not taking it out of the pan. So let me set this again. Because it's still very wet. And if you were to try to move that right now or slice it, the sauce would be oozing, the cheese would ooze, and it would be kind of messy. And plus, it's too hot anyway. You'll burn your mouth out if you try to eat that right now. It needs to cool. So we're going to let it sit there for 10 minutes, and then we'll take it out of the pan, put it on the pizza peel, and then we can cut it into slices, and then, of course, we can eat it. So we'll pause one more time for 10 minutes, and then we'll take it out of the pan. Okay back. Our 10 minutes are up. The pizza has been cooling. Here it is. I won't drop it this time. <laughs> and now what I want to do is loosen it. I'm using a cake server. Go around. See how I'm lifting and make sure it didn't stick before I did take it out. And usually there might be one spot or so if I miss with the spray, but usually it's okay. I'm just going to pry it up and slide it out right onto the pizza peel. Now if you don't have a pizza peel, if you have a big wooden board, if you don't, you could cut it in the pan if you wanted to, but it's much easier 
Then you have the pizza peel or big wooden board. Just move it over a little bit to cut it and to serve it. This is a pizza peel. Um, you can also use this to slide the pizza into the oven and out if you have all those ceramic tiles or a big stone. And this is a pizza wheel to cut. Most of the pizza restaurants have this. You just stick it in there and you have to go back and forth get through all those layers, the cheese, the tomatoes, and then of course the crust at the end. And you can cut whatever size slices you want. It's a little big, but that's okay. Check to see if it went all the way through. It didn't yet. There it is. You want to make sure your piece is loose. So when someone takes it, they don't pull the pizza apart. These also have to be sharpened every so often. Or you'd have to buy a new one. You have to get through that bottom crust, don't forget, plus the layers. You have the tomato in there, and the cheese. There we go. And just check it. Just You can use this um, cake server. You want it to look nice, you want it to come right out. You don't want to pull a piece out and have a mess. It's still hot, of course. The cheese is still a little oozy, but you don't want to eat it cold. Well, some people like it cold. You might wait till it gets cold. If you don't have a pizza wheel, just use a knife. It's not a big deal. A knife too. Just do a couple more and we're done. Notice I'm rotating the peel. I'm not trying to move the pizza because I'm cutting it. If you moved it now, it wouldn't work too well. And I can see it's really coming. One more and we're done. Some pieces are bigger, some smaller, but that's good because some people like bigger pieces and some people like smaller pieces. If you want to make it exactly even, you could cut it by cutting it in half, then in four.